Okay, so it's a really great pleasure to uh, have here uh, another Ilya Zhejkovic, a neighbor from Boston College, and unfortunately we can't see each other in person, but maybe next time. And um, Ilya obtained uh, his PhD at Harvard under uh, your advisor, were Jenny Hoffman, that she actually worked with quite a few of us here. And then you were postdoc at Boston College with Vidya Mahalavan, who uh, is now in Urbana and uh, you, uh, after that postdoc, you became, uh, it was a, did a fantastic work, a lot of topological study of topological phases of matter with um, STM and um, he has became faculty there uh, after that postdoc. And um, it's been there ever since and doing a very successful job on, you know, study of uh, quantum materials with STM. And so he's gonna tell us about it. Thank you very much, Vesna. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so thank you again for the invitation and thanks everybody for uh, being here today. Um, so in my talk, I'll tell you a little bit about how we can visualize electron spin information in quantum materials at single atom length scales. Um, so I will highlight an example of iridium oxides, uh, which are antiferromagnetic moth insulators. So as many of you know, uh, MAT insulators have been of great interest in the past uh, several decades now as the ground state of cuprate high temperature superconductors. Um, and uh, today I won't talk about cuprates, but I will talk about iridium oxides or particular family that are also um, antiferromagnetic MAT insulators. And I will tell you what happens uh, as you dope them and how we can actually see both the spin and charge information at single atom length scales using spin polarized scanning tunneling microscopy uh, or SPSDM. Um, so what is quantum materials and why do we use this term so broadly? Um, it encompasses essentially um, uh, various different exotic electronic materials. The term was coined maybe a decade or so ago, uh, basically to denote different uh, systems that cannot be easily explained by textbook physics. Um, so here I'm just, kind of highlighting some of the examples close to my heart. So that includes high temperature superconductivity or zero resistance in materials below certain superconducting uh, transition, colossal magnetic resistance, various topological phases such as topological insulators, topological superconductors, uh, some more exotic wild, Dirac semi-metals and so on. Um, so again, this is not an exhaustive list, just a few examples. Um, and what I want to highlight in this regard is that um, to get these exotic properties in many of these quantum materials, you need to introduce chemical homogeneity. Or in other words, you need to dope uh, the systems. Um, that inevitably leads to spatial inhomogeneity, and that can um, in turn be structural inhomogeneity or electronic or magnetic sometimes all together. Um, so to really fully understand what happens in these materials, um, it is highly desirable to use a local measurement probe. So this is something that we use uh, in my lab to understand various quantum materials. Um, okay, so today's talk will focus on imaging uh, spin properties in materials. And I will tell you how spin polarized STM works. Um, but here I just wanted to put this technique in a broader kind of spectrum of different uh, techniques that can be used uh, to measure nanoscale magnetic properties. So many of them are rooted in scanning probe microscopy. Um, such as, for example, NV center scanning probe uh, imaging, uh, scanning squared magnetic force microscopy, and so on. So they all, um, you know, work in a slightly different way. Um, so what I want to kind of mention is that, you know, most of these techniques that I have here, uh, the spatial resolution that you can achieve is anywhere from, you know, a few nanometers to maybe tens of nanometers, sometimes even larger than that. So, um, you know, very few of them actually have atomic resolution to um, resolve individual, for example, atomic defects and so on. So spin polarized STM is one of the few techniques that's actually able to resolve this kind of like sub nanometer resolution. Uh, and this is what we use uh, in my lab. So before I get into kind of uh, uh, the physics that I wanted to highlight today, I just want to briefly mention some of the capabilities of my lab that we've set up at BC um, in the past five years. So um, it is a combined molecular beam epitaxy or MBE 
and STM lab. Um, so even though I won't talk about MB growth at all today, I still want to mention that we do a great deal of uh, growth of MB uh, thin films. Uh, so we have three different MB systems in my lab. So the first one is a home-built MB system uh, that my first graduate student built from scratch. And right now it's used for the growth of tellurium-based topological materials. Um, and then we have this customized commercial dual MB system where there's an oxide MBE for the growth of oxides and then a selenium-based MBE that's currently being used for the growth of uh, superconductor RN selenide, but also some of the uh, Kagomi, uh, Kagomi RN-based systems as well. Um, so once you grow these materials, if you want to characterize them, so these are some of the main techniques in addition to um, standard transport and magnetization that we also use. Uh, so namely, we use a low temperature uh, STM. So we have two STMs in our lab. Uh, they both uh, go down to sub-Kelvin temperatures. Uh, we are able to apply as high as 11 Tesla magnetic field in situ while we are doing STM measurements. Um, and then there's also a probe station where we're able to do uh, transport in, in vacuum, which is um, uh, quite important for air sensitive films. Um, one of the unique aspects of my lab is that we are able to connect all these different pieces of vacuum equipment entirely um, together by using a vacuum suitcase. Um, so vacuum suitcase is just the name we use to denote uh, a small vacuum chamber um, that's not so small. It's actually kind of heavy. So we had to put it on, on wheels to actually be able to wheel it to any of these pieces of equipment. Um, and um, we kind of uh, connect it. And then there's like a vacuum path essentially from an MB into the suitcase. So we're able to take the film, uh, put it in our suitcase, disconnect the suitcase, keep it at about 10 to the minus 10 tour throughout this, connect it to, for example, STM and or any other piece of equipment and so on. So that allows us to study uh, pristine surfaces of different materials, which again, if you're studying a monolayer or bilayer of something, you really don't want to expose it to air. So this way, you know, we never expose our materials to air. Um, so these are some of the examples of the materials that we've been uh, focused on the past uh, few years. Um, in yellow, denoting homegrown MBE films. Uh, so those are various topological materials, some of the RMBase systems that I mentioned. Um, in white are cleaved bulk single crystals of uh, you know, various materials that we get from our collaborators from uh, around the world. Um, so um, we study both the thin films and the single crystals. Um, and what I will focus on today is really these two. Okay, so we have um, these uh, iridium oxides, so strontium-2 iridium-04 and 327, uh, which are uh, this new family of antiferromagnetic multi insulators that we've been focusing on. Okay, so um, let me briefly go back to the MOT insulator problem um, and just kind of quickly describe how are MOT insulators different than conventional BN insulators. Um, so if you look at this BN diagram, so on the y-axis, I have energy on the x-axis, I have momentum, and this squiggly line is an electronic band. So this is taken from an undergraduate textbook. Um, and if you look at uh, what happens at the brilliant zone boundary? You actually get gaps due to the Bragg reflection. And we know if we occupy this lower band here and put the Fermi level within this bulk band gap, what we're going to see is that you actually get a band insulator. Okay, so this is a conventional band insulator. So if you now deplete some of these electrons from the band and maybe place the Fermi level here, you get a partially filled band, and the conventional band theory would tell us this is a metal. Um, but that's not always the case. And a prototypical counterexample is the parent state of copper oxide superconductors, or cuprates. Um, um, I already said I won't talk too much about the cuprates, but one of the motivations for our work was really um, the similarity between the materials that we're studying and the cuprates. Um, so um, cuprates are multi insulator, and if you look at the copper oxide plane that each cuprate material actually has. Each copper site is occupied by exactly one electron. Um, the state is antiferromagnetic, so you have a staggered orientation of spins. Um, it's a half-filled band, so that should lead to metal, but it actually shows that it is an insulator. And this is a combination due to um, really strong on-site repulsion. So there's a large penalty, energy penalty that you will pay 
to occupy the same site with two electrons. So they kind of orient themselves in this way. Um, uh, I won't go into details too much. This is kind of uh, the high level understanding of Mott insulators that I wanted to present. But one of the things I wanted to mention is that this state is often accompanied by anti-ferromagnetic order. Okay, so this is something that hasn't been studied too much on the atomic length scales that this is what we were trying to tackle. Um, so the phase diagram of high TC cuprates kind of looks like this. If you uh, just uh, outline some of the prominent phases, um, and then if you look at what local scanning tunnel microscopy characterization was able to do, it was mostly focused on different uh, phases in the superconducting state and the pseudo gap state. So we have um, charge ordering that was discovered within the superconducting dome, a partial opening of the gap at the Fermi level, which we still call a pseudo gap, uh, which is inhomogeneous if you look at it uh, closely on nanometer length scales. Uh, there is a checkerboard pattern inside the vortex cores and so on. Um, but what happens really near this antiferromagnetic insulating state? So you start with a parent state, um, which has, uh, you know, uh, no, the, the doping is effectively zero, and then you start introducing the charge carriers. Um, so there hasn't been too much done, really, what happens as the first few charge carriers are introduced. Um, and in cuprates, at least, the problem was the difficulty of synthesizing and measuring near insulating cuprates using the same method that described above. So STM is actually not very good at imaging insulators. Actually, it's quite bad. But you know, if they're weak insulators, in a sense, maybe the band gap is slightly smaller, you may be able to actually get the tunneling current and image these. Uh, so there hasn't been done in cuprates. But here, we focus on a new family of MAT insulators, which are the strontium iridium oxides that I am um, that I'm showing here. So this is their structure. So they're basically composed of this iridium oxide octahedra, similarly to copper oxide octahedra in cuprates, and it's a layered structure. Um, relevant to the physics of these iridates is that each iridium atom actually has 5D electrons. So again, you would think, okay, so there's an odd number of electrons, so maybe we have a metal, but due to a combination of strong spin-orbit coupling, and electronic repulsion, you actually split this band into effective three half band and one half band. And then that's due to spin orbit coupling. And then due to this U term, you've split the one half band into what's effectively the upper Hubbard band and a lower Hubbard band. So then you can accommodate four electrons here and one electron here, um, but um, uh, sorry, you accommodate five electrons here, and then you essentially get an insulator due to this, um, uh, due to this, uh, these two properties here. Okay, so it's a MOT insulator. And it's, as I will show you, it has gaps that can be tuned in different structures. So this strontium-214 actually has a larger gap. The 327 has a much smaller gap, and both of these can be further tuned by chemical, chemical doping. Um, so what has been known in, for example, strontium-2 iridium-04 uh, before, before our measurement? So this is the rough phase diagram. The AF denotes antiferromagnetism. So this is kind of like the yellow region here. Um, and then in some similarity to cuprates, what people have seen is in near insulating state, you can actually image it using STM and you get this large uh, insulating gap as you dope it further towards the metallic states, you start seeing this charge glassiness. This is again, reminiscent to charge ordering in cuprates. Um, and there's also, uh, maybe not so surprisingly, um, a pseudo gap um, or a partial gap opening as even as you increase the temperature, it kind of persists to relatively high temperature. Um, so um, a question we wanted to address is now that we can actually do SDN, um, in a very lightly do doped uh, mat state, uh, can spatial inhomogeneous magnetism explain any of this inhomogeneity? So there has really been no information of what this antiferromagnetic ordering does as you dope it. Okay, so this is something that we're going to try to focus on. Um, the can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Uh, what does the uh, resistivity versus temperature look like? Um, Offhand, uh, I don't, um, 
it, it depends for like the doping. So for the zero percent, you know, obviously have this like large upturn, but you can use maybe like a one percent doping for mm -hmm. sodium that gets much less insulating. It's still insulating, but it's much less so. And I don't, I don't remember the orders of magnitude exactly, but maybe after the talk, I can point you to the papers. And uh, uh, yeah. So this gap is the single particle uh, electronic gap, right? Correct. Single particle excitation. Okay. Correct. Yeah, the one that I'm showing on the lower left. Yes. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, so going back to the antiferromagnetic ground state. Um, so if you compare what is this antiferromagnetic ordering in the single layer and the bilayer iridate, um, the main difference is that the spins point in plane for one and out of plane for the other. Um, it's still antiferromagnetic ordering in plane. So each adjacent iridium site has spins that point in the opposite direction. Um, and these are the approximate phase diagrams for both. So the temperature is on the y-axis and lanthanum concentration is on the x-axis. So lanthanum is a dopant that substitute for strontium. So as you actually introduce a few percent of these lanthanum dopants, you can see that based on neutron scattering and based on magnetization measurements, this long range order actually slowly disappears. And we wanted to see how it actually disappears. An advantage is that Compared to cuprates, we can actually access this near insulating state um, using STM. So in particular, the technique we use for the visualization of spin information is spin polarized STM. So I will briefly tell you how it works. Um, STM in general, so conventional STM, uh, consists of a sample and a metallic tip that you bring about five or so angstroms uh, from one another, and then you apply a voltage between the sample and the tip, and then what we know is that the electrons will actually tunnel through this vacuum barrier and the STM will measure the number of electrons that tunnel um, at any given real space position as a function of time. Um, there are several main data sets that STM can take. In general, these are three dimensional data sets where you can position the tip at any point X and Y on the sample and then sweep as a function of energy and measure the tunneling current. So if you take a so-called DIDV spectrum or differential conductance spectrum, um, it is proportional to the density of states. You can raster the tip across the sample, what we call a DIDV map. So it's set at one energy or one bias that's applied between the tip and the sample. And you can see how the differential conductance evolves spatially. Um, and then probably the most commonly used mode is the so-called STM topograph, which is acquired in constant current mode. So you sweep your tip across the sample at some constant tunneling current. And the height variations are essentially detected in the topograph. So the topograph, which is important to in, in the interpretation of any STM measurements, actually contains both the structural information and also the information about the integrated density of states. So it's kind of impossible to disentangle the two. Both of them are actually buried in this topograph. Here. OK, so what about electron spin? So how can we know anything about the spin of these electrons that are tunneling? Um, so using spin polarized STM is one of the ways you can get a sense of what is uh, uh, kind of like a, uh, a spin related information in your sample. Um, I won't go into details of what exactly happens here, but I want to highlight one difference. And that says what happens if your tip is actually magnetic pointing with a spin of the kind of the, the, the last most atom pointing in some well-defined direction. So let's say you have a sample that has the spin pointing downwards. And then let's see what is the tunneling current. If you tip it also has the same spin or it has an opposite spin compared to the sample. So if the tip and the sample barrier in these two cases is actually exactly the same. So this tunneling barrier is the same height. Um, what we will see is that the tunneling current that has a term that's proportional to kind of the misalignment or alignment between the spins of the tip and the sample, the tunneling current in this left case is actually going to be larger than the one in the right case. Okay, the only difference between the left and the right one is misorientation of the spins of the tip and the sample. Okay? So this is really what I want um, to kind of highlight on a very high level. Um, what is it that the spin polarized STM detects? So it's a small difference in the tunneling current due to the misalignment of the spins of the tip, which is a magnetic probe of some sort, and your sample. Um, so how can we detect this information? 
in a spatially inhomogeneous sample. So we have a tip that has some spin. We have, you know, this is very uh, kind of a schematic of a sample that has domains of spins pointing to the left and point to the right. And if we scan the tip in a constant current mode, which means that the height of the tip is adjusted to maintain the constant current, you will see that the height will actually change as you go from left to the right. So the tip will have to get closer to the sample to get the same tunneling current if the spins of the tip and the sample are misaligned. And then when they're almost perfectly aligned in this region here, the tip kind of pulls back a little bit. So this kind of difference in the spin information is reflected in the topography itself. Um, so um, to introduce kind of in a real system how SPSTM works, I'm showing uh, STM topography or spin polarized SM topography, as I will show on the bottom, of R and Telluride. Um, so before the tip is spin polarized, so if you have a non-magnetic tip, the topography of R and Telluride is going to show a square lattice, as is shown here. So each one of the small bumps is actually, a, I believe, a single tellurium atom. And then if you, for example, pick up in a magnetic atom or two magnetic atoms on your tip, the same area of the sample is going to look like this. So it looks very different immediately. So that just shows you that spin polarized STM is really nothing but a conventional STM with a few magnetic tip, magnetic atoms on the top of your sample. So uh, Ilya, yeah. sorry to interrupt, but there looks like there's a question in the chat. Um, okay. I can read it. What, what is the approximate magnitude of tunneling currents that are measured in these experiments? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, so the tunneling current that we measure are typically at the order of 100 picoamps, hundreds of picoamps, maybe. Um, they vary from, let's say, 50 picoamps to 500 picoamps. Uh, can I ask a follow up question on this one? This is a very oh. good question. Okay, so the, um, uh, so in order for you to, to, for the electron to tunnel, the wave function from the tip and the, the, the sample uh, have to overlap, right? And then, but if they do overlap, don't you have some kind of a hybridization between the two atoms? And that could change the interpretation a little bit? Hybridization between what two atoms? Uh, of the, uh, uh, the, the two wave functions from the tip and from the sample. Okay. So, so, so in other words, if I, let's say I'm, uh, uh, tap my hand on the table to feel the shape of the table. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, let's say my finger is very stiff, but then it doesn't change. Then whatever I map out is the shape of the table. Okay. But if uh, my finger can deform a little bit re relative to the shape of the sample, then what, how I feel would be the, the, the shape would be a little distorted, don't you? So I'm wondering this distortion is, is due to the due to that. You, essentially your 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 current is no longer uh, rigidly correlated to the spatial information. Um, I'm not sure if that can be the case. So first of all, like we're not in any sort of tapping mode, right? When you talk about your hand feeling the table. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about tapping. I'm just talking about strictly just the wave function, right? Yes. So even if you think about, you know, strictly the overlap of, you know, the, the, the wave functions, I mean, the truth is, you know, we don't really see that last atom on the tip of the tip, you know, so this overlap of the wave functions is kind of, um, you know, we, we can't know exactly what it is, but empirically we know that in many different samples is that what you see by spin polar is the SDA, um, the, this additional ordering that I'm showing, for example, here, it's consistent with bulk probes. Okay, so in R and Telly, right, you expect, you know, this two by one ordering that you exactly see here on the bottom, based on, for example, neutron scattering, exactly in the same orientation with the same period. And this is what we see with the spin polarized STM. So the zeroth approximation is what I'm basically showing in a previous slide, where you have this misalignment on spins, and you're detecting that extra kind of wave vector in your spin polarized STM topographies. Is there a secondary correction based on due to some you know, maybe non-trivial overlap of the wave functions, it's certainly possible, but I don't, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how, um, you know, if, if that's relevant to like the main kind of measurement that's pinpolarized. Okay, thank you. 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 Thank
I guess that's mm -hmm. as much as I can answer it kind of like a short Because I feel like, um, okay, so you, uh, on one hand, we want the wave function to overlap in order for you to, to detect the, the tunneling current. But at the same time, you do not want this coupling to be uh, relevant to the um, to the uh, to the structure of the sample that I'm measuring. So I'm wondering whether these two can be um, compatible. In other words, you, you on one hand you said, "Well, um, uh, so, I need so, the uh, wave function to overlap." Yeah. Yeah, I, th I I think you know we can we can talk after the talk, um, but. Okay. Uh, what I can tell you is that empirically, you know, there's been mm -hmm. evidence on like many different samples, typically like these very magnetic samples, where what you're measuring with spin polarized STM is like still consistent with you know other bulk probes. We are just measuring, mm -hmm. you know, again to reiterate, if there's some kind of secondary correction, um, I'm not sure. But it's okay. what I will show in this talk is that the wave vector, the orientation, and anti-ferromagnetic ordering we see in these zero dates in this mm -hmm. doped state is exactly mm -hmm. consistent with neutrons. Okay, all right, thank you. Let's move on, yeah. 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 Okay, so in any case, um, the spin polarized STM topography, where you just change a few atoms that become magnetic of the tip of your tip is gonna show these stripes, and this is due to the orientation of spins on the same. Okay, so now we're actually detecting spin information, and we can see that in the Fourier transform of the image, but you can also see very easily by eye. So experimentally, what we change is really just, as I said, a tip apex. Okay, so in our experiments, we use uh, chemically etched uh, bulk chromium tips that we actually prepare uh, on the surface of our telluride so that we can tune the spin at the tip of the STM probe. So what I mean by that is, um, I'm going to use the phrase train the tip, and then I'm going to explain a little bit what it means. So we train the tip on a material that we know, which is this iron telluride, um, where we essentially kind of tweak the polarization of the tip um, by, for example, fast scanning, by applying electrical pulses, until we are able to see the reversal of the contrast as you apply the magnetic field uh, in different directions. Okay, So if you apply two Tesla, and I guess I have here minus three Tesla on the other side. Uh, this is STM topography using a magnetic tip of the same area of the sample under different magnetic field. So one is pointing out of the plane and one is pointing into the plane. Um, and you can see already um, these little stripes that are kind of horizontal stripes. So this is due to the anti ordering of the sample that I've shown you on the previous slide. Uh, but there's something else that really happens as you apply a different field. Um, so there's a, a strong coupling in this iron telluride, so nothing really happens in the sample as you reverse the direction of the magnetic field. But uh, what happens is that you actually flip the spin of the tip from spin up, let's say, to spin down, and then you're able to actually change the position of these stripes from the image on the left to the image on the right. Um, and I'm gonna show you exactly what I mean by this. So if you take these two topographies, so maybe for uh, most of you in the audience, unless you have a really good eye, you are probably not going to be able to see much of a difference. Um, if we take the average of these two topographies and put it in a kind of slightly more appealing color scale, you get essentially the same thing you see here. But let me show you what happens if we take the difference of these two. So if I take this image and subtract by the image below, pixel by pixel, I get these stripes that are very clear, um, which is what we will call an M map or spin resolve signal, uh, which essentially tells me that there is a staggered orientation of spins in my sample. So I reversed the spin polarization of the tip. So basically, wherever I had a bright stripe in, in the top image, I have a dark stripe in the bottom image. So once you subtract the two, you actually amplify the difference. Um, and the difference is not structural. So all these atoms that you're seeing, the little bumps, um, they're not appearing here. So as you change the field, nothing structurally changes, but it's really the magnetic information that you're able to extract. So in this talk, I will really focus on the use of these um, kind of subtraction method in the different topographies obtained uh, at different fields.
Okay, so you can also see this different in the Fourier transform. So if I Fourier transform this M map, uh, these red points here are the atomic Bragg peaks, which are not present, but then you have a very strong pixel exactly at 2A0, which is the period of the anti-ferromagnetic ordering in our antenna. Okay, so once we have, so all, all so far that I've told you is essentially the SPSTM setup. So we have a magnetic tip. We test it on our telluride, which is by our standards, relatively boring system, uh, but we know how the tip works. So we know we can flip the spin polarization of the tip by flipping the magnetic field. And now we go into imaging iridates. Okay, so single crystals of lanthan and dope strontium iridate are about a millimeter in size. We get them from uh, Stephen Wilson's group at Santa Barbara, where they grow uh, various different dopings. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, these are 2D or quasi 2D materials. So they naturally cleave along the 0, 0, 001 plane. So we actually cleave maybe between these two. And then we image the top surface in STM. We cleave at low temperature at about 80 Kelvin to prevent surface reconstruction. And all the measurements that I'm going to show you um, for the majority of the talk are acquired at 4 Kelvin. So this is the top view of the sample. Uh, we are imaging these green balls here, which are the strontium atoms. And then obviously we are detecting the signal for some of the bottom layers as well. So uh, if you look at the structure and try to figure out what is the expected Fourier transform, so these red peaks here denoted the atomic Bragg peaks and QA and QB are actually peaks of this anti ordering. So if you just look at the magnetic unit cell, which is this, um, uh, this larger unit cell here. Okay, so this is gonna to lead to this smaller unit cell in the Fourier transform. Uh, the Q and QB B peaks should be related to the magnetic units. So if you take an STM topograph, you take the Fourier transform, you're actually able to see various peaks that I denoted here on the left. And then what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna use this magnetic field dependence. So we're gonna apply the field in various directions to change the polarization of the tip and really tease out the magnetic signal at QA and QB, okay? So this is something that hasn't been done in any of the complex oxides before, um, partially uh, because preparing these magnetic tips is non-trivial, uh, but in a sense, um, this iridase provided an ideal platform due to ease of cleaving and really being able to tunnel into this very anti insulating regime. Um, so I'm gonna show you a typical data set uh, that we acquire for, uh, here it's a 2% lanthan and doped strontium-214. So this is a topography at plus three Tesla and a topography at minus three Tesla. So uh, this is an identical area of the sample and the field is again, just reversed. Um, so if you take the average, it kind of looks like either of these two, but if you subtract the two images, the one here and the one here, you're gonna get a very prominent checkerboard that's rotated about 45 degrees away with respect to the atomic lattice that we see. If I fully transform this image here, you get four peaks that are exactly at QA and QB. So this is exactly what you would expect from this anti-ferromagnetic signal coming from the underlying uh, AF ordering in the iridium oxide pair. Okay, so it's uh, exactly the same wave vector um, that, for example, neutron scattering would tell us. So neutron scattering at this doping tells us that the correlation length scale is about 100 nanometers or so. Okay, so in STM images, 100 nanometers would be um, fairly large to do. Um, so typically a more feasible measurement is something at the order of 20 nanometers or so at least for the spin polarized STM. And what we can see in this entire field of view is that we have kind of uniform periodic modulations of these wave vector, which is consistent with long range magnetic work. Um, just to convince you for the skeptics in the audience that we're actually detecting something that's related to spin information and this field reversal doesn't really do something uh, more elaborate to the sample. So I'm taking a non-spin polarized tip, I'm taking uh, a topography of the same sample at a slightly different position at plus three Tesla and minus three Tesla. I subtract them, which I'm showing here. And this M map, that's now a difference between two topographies uh, that acquired with a non-spin polarized tip shows no periodicity. 
Okay, so there's no QA and QBs. There's really nothing there, no matter how kind of high you zoom in. So that really tells us that what we were detecting with this spin polarized sticks is intrinsic magnetic or anti-ferromagnetic orderliness. Okay, so um, we were very excited when we were able to actually see anti-ferromagnetic ordering. So this is actually the first time anti-ferromagnetic ordering has been imaged um, with atomic resolution in any oxide. So iridium oxides or any other oxide out there. So we just wanted to see kind of how far can we push this uh, and what kind of interesting physics can we get um, now that we're able to resolve this magnetic ordering at atomic length scales. Um, so as I already said, you know, our results so far kind of replicated what neutron scattering did in the bulk. Um, but we wanted to see what happens as you go to higher doping. So at 5% um, lengthen of doping, you're near insulator to metal transition. Okay, so based on uh, transport measurements, uh, you're really almost there, you know, plus minus maybe 1% of lengthen of doping. And we wanted to see what is the magnetic ordering in this region. So we acquire two topographies at two different fields. And if I kind of flip between the two, you can already see there's something going on there. Um, the reason why we don't use the, the same two fields for um, the measurement here, it, as long as you flip the spin of the tip, it really doesn't matter what field you use, okay? So the field is simply used to take a spin up tip to spin down or the other way around, okay? So you, you don't have to use symmetric fields at all. Um, so in this case, we use asymmetric fields, but we subtract these images and we get something like this. Okay, so this is an M map of the 5% strontium iridate, uh, where again, you see these periodic modulations or almost periodic modulations, but the image looks less uniform than before. So you can see a pi phase shift. So if you follow the lines here and follow the lines here, there's a clear kind of domain line between the two. If you take a Fourier transform, well, the strongest peaks are still at this QA and QB. They're a little more diffuse because you don't have periodic ordering everywhere. So you can clearly see regions where there's no magnetic ordering. So the, the, the bonds that correspond to this anti magnetic ordering are kind of like mostly gone. Okay. So our insight is that anti magnetic ordering is spatially homogeneous. Okay. So even on these 10 nanometer length scales, you, know, you can see regions that are very different. This is the same measurement, but a different crystal at the same doping level. Okay, just to show you, this is not an artifact of our measurement. You know, um, this is, I think this was acquired at plus minus half a Tesla. So in this case, we take two topographies at a very small field. So half a Tesla in opposite directions, we subtract and we get this. Okay, so again, we get Q and QB, which are anti-vermagnetic ordering peaks. We can even fully filter this to make it clear. So if you just, Kind of keep these four peaks and inverse Fourier transform the image, you can see it varies quite a bit from area to area. Okay. So the key question that we wanted to adjust next is what is the relationship between the short range anti-ferromagnetic ordering, which is what we see here, and the charge gap that we haven't talked too much about yet, uh, except showing you that in this uh, insulating state, you have a single particle charge gap. Okay, so this is the next part of my talk where we try to relate the spin information, which is really the new insight that we were able to gain in the systems and then the charge information. Um, I'm gonna show you two representative DIDV line cuts. So the DIDV spectrum represent density of states. So the fact that you have like a flat bottom DIDV spectrum here, this is a gap. Okay. And in 2% sample, the sample shows insulating gap or this charge gap everywhere with different magnitudes. So you can see it kind of varies a little bit, um, but it's everywhere. But then as you go to the 5% dope sample in the phase diagram, this is the little red star that uh, my student drew here, um, the spectra start to vary a little bit. So you see regions where you still see this insulating gap. And we know, you know it's insulating because if you lower your STM bias, close to zero, your tip is simply going to crash. We've tried that once and we haven't tried that again, but typically these insulating gaps are truly insulating gaps. So that means there's no tunneling current as you uh, kind of reach this bias here. In any case, in a different region of the sample, you start seeing this V-shaped spectrum, okay? So this is something that resembles pseudo gap in coup rates and has been um, in years prior to our experiments, a lot of effort to really understand what is this V-shaped spectrum. 
Okay, um, so we wanted to see, does it relate to antiferromagnetic ordering that's inhomogeneous? So to quantitatively uh, address this, what we did is we uh, took a DID spectrum at every point in our image. So every pixel is a single DID spectrum. Some prototypical spectrums are shown here. And then we calculate for each spectrum, what is the magnitude of the charge gap? So in other words, what is the magnitude of the region of zero conductance near the formula and assign a color to it? So you go from a very small gap to a very large gap, and you can see this gap vary on nanometer length scales. And this is consistent with previous work. So we are not the first ones that image this charge in homogeneity in iridates, uh, but now we can do it over the same area of the sample where we see magnetic order. Okay, so these two, this is a Fourier filtered M map where we see patches of antiferromagnetic ordering and patches where antiferromagnetic ordering is absent and a charge gap. And we want to correlate it. So we can create an intensity map. So the dark color here is strong antiferromagnetic ordering. The white color is weak AF ordering. And if you try to correlate the two, well, there's many different ways you can correlate two kind of two-dimensional images over the same area. You can take a cross-correlation coefficients, um, which I will show later. Um, maybe the most easy, easily visualized way um, that correlates the two variables is superimpose the outline of these AF regions on top of the gap map, um, and then histogram the entire gap map, which is you know, shown in this blue, um, uh, uh, blue columns here, and then histogram the charge gap just from the magnetic regions. Okay, from these kind of like small puddles. This is in the red denoted here. So you can see the general distribution of the two is actually pretty much the same. So we were, if the two were correlated, we were expecting maybe the gaps in these magnetic regions are only gonna cluster at high values or the low values, but we found out there's really no correlation. Um, and this has been confirmed in the bilayer iridate as well. So if we looked at the 3% doped strontium-327, so it's the same family of iridates, but now it's a bilayer iridate, so there's two iridium oxide planes, and we repeated the same measurements. So here on this slide, I'm basically summarizing, you know, 10 worth of slides into a single thing, um, and we do simple cross-correlation between panel E, which is our strength of antiferromagnetic ordering, and panel B, which is the strength of the charge gap. Um, I think the correlation between the two is this green curve. Okay, so there's no strong correlation at all. Okay, so this confirms what we visually saw on, on the other sample as well. Okay, so what we were able to find is that this short range antiferromagnetic order, even once we visualize it, is not really responsible for these V shaped pseudo gap regions uh, near insulator to metal transition. So that was surprising to us, um, but um, it uh, certainly rules out the origin of these V shaped gaps. Um, we're still not able to, to kind of say what these V-shaped gaps relate to, but at least we can rule out an important culprit that was um, kind of inaccessible before our measurements. Um, okay, so um, after we performed these experiments, we kind of got excited and want, wanted to see what really governs um, this inhomogeneous spatial distribution of antiferromagnets. So whenever you see something that's spatially inhomogeneous, we wanted, uh, you might wonder if it's related to doping or is it related to some kind of temperature fluctuations near critical point um, or something else. So we repeated the same measurements on many different dopings of this. Now I'm gonna focus on bilayer iridates, strontium-327. So we substituted ruthenium for iridium, we substituted lanthanum for strontium, and my student painfully had to repeat this experiment on many, many, many different samples. Um, so all these were acquired in this insulating regime here, um, where basically everything we've seen is consistent with neutron scattering, uh, in the sense that, you know, where we are expected to see antiferromagnetic ordering, we see it, and when we don't, we don't. Um, in this lightly doped lanthanum substitute region, we, of the phase diagram, we see these patches. Okay, so this is now a third sample that I've shown you, where you see little patches of antiferromagnetism. Um, so the first question we wanted to answer is, you know, what happens if you heat a sample up above the antiferromagnetic ordering temperature, you wipe out these regions, 
and then you cool it back down and see um, kind of like, do they stay at the same place? Do they move? Now we can actually track the same field of view uh, as a function of temperature. So I'm gonna show you actually what happened next. Um, so this is a region of the sample that we focus on. Um, we take this M map intensity, which the dark color represents strong antiferromagnetism, weak color represents weak antiferromagnetism. And then we track the same field of view as a function of temperature, start at five Kelvin, seven Kelvin, nine Kelvin. So this is the same field of view. Um, and you can already see that you know, the overall intensity or an average intensity drops down pretty quickly. Um, the average spectrum doesn't change very much. Okay, so that means you know this V-shaped spectrum again is really unrelated to any sort of antiferromagnetism. Um, but the interesting thing that we found is what happens as you cool back the sample. Okay, so from about ten Kelvin, we go back down to five Kelvin, um, and then we image it again. So we regain some of this magnetic intensity. Um, so an average intensity is going to be comparable before and after thermal cycling, but the puddles look notably at different places. And I'm kind of highlighting a few places here where you can see that strong AF ordering here is basically gone after thermal cycling. You know, maybe there's a little bit of antiferromagnetic ordering that appeared here and so on. So um, it seems like thermal cycling can actually change this ordering in some regions of the sink. Okay, so this is, um, um, you know, something that, uh, well, I guess we weren't sure what to expect before the measurements, uh, but it, it was very clear that small temperature fluctuations can drive this orientation of these puddles dramatically. Um, this is a histogram of uh, the average intensity as a function of temperature. So this is extracted from these four images here. Um, you can see the first and the fourth one show nearly the same average intensity. So if you um, did this experiment by some kind of uh, a bulk probe measurement, you may not be able to see the difference, but really uh, being able to visualize what happens on atomic light scales kind of allows us to discern this difference, okay? So these two are actually quite correlated, even though the spatially, they look different, okay? And I'm gonna show you why they're correlated in a sec. Um, to um, kind of answer this question, we looked at defects. So STM is probably the most famous for being able to visualize individual atomic defects on the surface of different materials. Um, so here I'm gonna highlight the two. Um, and both of them are lantern and dopants, which are denoted by this blue sphere here, in different planes. Okay, so the first one is the lantern and dopant in the topmost plane. It is seen as these little squares that I'm showing here. Okay, so we can identify them from STM topographies. We superimpose their positions and painfully count them across the entire field of view, and then superimpose them on the M map. And then just looking by eye, it doesn't seem like there's a strong correlation between the two. They're kind of pretty much everywhere. So then we focused on the length and dopants in the middle plane. So now, instead of looking at these dopants in the top plane, we're looking at them in the middle plane superimpose them on top of this AF ordering map or the M map. And now even by eye, you can kind of see they're mostly located in regions where antiferromagnetic ordering is weak. So um, the antiferromagnetic ordering is kind of destroyed in the proximity of these lanthan of dopants in this middle lanthan oxide layer, and then uh, it persists away from that. So basically the picture based on our measurements that emerges is that you have this fluid formation of antiferromagnetic ordering as you go through this transition near the antiferromagnetic transition point. So you have different puddles that form away from these lanthan and dopants that can rearrange themselves, but either way they stay away from these lanthan and dopants here. And you know, we can show this or quantitatively, what is the cross correlation between different variables. Um, so, um, what I'm showing here is, you know, each one of these correlated with the dopant maps. Um, what I want to highlight is that these blue lantern and dopants here, which are corresponding to these blue curves here, um, they uh, are strongly correlated with antiferromagnetic ordering both before thermal cycling and after thermal cycling as well. Okay. So we kind of pinpointed a defect that seems to do uh, something in 
um, in this system. So it really pins um, or like destroys the magnetic ordering look. Um, so let me see. So I'm, I, I know I'm running low on time, so I'm gonna um, maybe spend a few minutes just very briefly talk about the last piece of um, kind of experiments or analysis that we did that I think is really exciting. Um, so, you know, in, in two-dimensional images that we get, we see some kind of patterns, right? I mean, if you describe what I've seen to, you know, maybe a, a middle schoolers, right? We see some patterns, okay? And you can kind of almost draw these patterns by hand. If you binarize these images, well, you know, this is what it looks like. So we have puddles of anti-fermagnetic ordering. So what can we really learn from these patterns? Um, and in, you know, the past, few years or so, maybe even a decade now, maybe even longer, uh, there's been this concept of examining this domain texture based on the concept of fractality. So the concept of fractality, of course, is dates you know, many, many years back. Um, uh, but quantitative analysis from STM data has really emerged maybe in the last decade or so, uh, steered by uh, Erica Carlson's group. Um, so, what it does is it is essentially examines how uh, repeatable are the patterns at any length scale. So Snowflake is a great example that we all know, and it kind of looks the same if you zoom in on the tip here and the tip of the tip and so on. So um, you can use a percolation theory to actually model how, how fractal are your domains. So again, I'm not gonna go into too many details, but you essentially, you can, from a two-dimensional data set, you can outline the clusters. For each cluster, which is essentially a connected uh, set of pixels, you can define the area, the perimeter, and a bunch of other properties. Uh, then you can plot, okay, so for example, for this one, the area is three pixels, the perimeter is eight pixels, and so on. So based on, for example, the work that was done on cuprates, you can take the STM data, you can binarize the image, you can figure out what is the domain of charge orders. Um, and then you can plot these geometric uh, kind of quantities related to these um, domains um, as a function of different parameters. Okay, so um, if there is some kind of uh, fract fractality in the patterns, you're gonna see this uh, logarithmic scaling across several orders of magnitude um, in, uh, in different properties. Okay, so this is exactly what we performed in our data. So we take these fractal patterns, we remove the boundary clusters, um, we create these kind of uh, two-dimensional images and we count their properties. Um, to make a long story short, if you plot these geometric properties for our samples, you see the same kind of logarithmic scaling that you would expect and that you've seen or we've seen in, in cuprates before. So what can we learn from here? Well, our magnetic patterns are fractal. That might indicate a proximity to a, an underlying critical point. Uh, but of course, the only evidence for criticality is really that our data fits this theory. But it uh, essentially, it could uh, be related to some kind of underlying critical point, which is you know, something that we are trying to look into uh, right now. Um, so uh, in any case, um, yeah, let me summarize um, some, of the, some of the things that I've told you and I hope I was able to convince you in the past hour or so. Um, so we used SPSTM to provide the first imaging of antiferromagnetic ordering in any complex oxide. Um, then as you kind of investigate or as we investigated what happened as a function of doping, we found that antiferromagnetic ordering actually fragments as you approach insulator to metal transition. Um, but the antiferromagnetic ordering is not locally correlated with the spectral gap. Okay, so it seems that there is another variable that kind of relates to the interplay between these two. Um, after thermal cycling, we found that antiferromagnetic domains actually rearrange themselves quite a bit, uh, but they seem to stay away from one particular uh, uh, type of lanthanum dopants that's in the middle uh, uh, strontium or iridium oxide plane. Um, and then once we analyzed the clusters, we were actually able to find uh, the follow fractal geometry. So they're not kind of random clusters that are formed. They're, they're based on the shape, uh, this is uh, like a sign of strong correlations as well. Um, so to acknowledge people that have done the work, so her is uh, my first PhD student that just graduated 
Um, and after a short stint in my lab as a postdoc, left for a proper postdoc uh, this past week, but he's been painfully taking this data for you know one or two years, um, trying to get as many doping and different, different compositions as, as he could. Uh, the, all the uridate crystals are provided by Professor Stephen Wilson's group, uh, and we have an ongoing theoretical collaboration with Professor uh, Ziken Wang here at BC as well. Um, this work was primarily supported by DOE, um, but um, some of the implementation of spin polarized STM in the first place was uh, also um, uh, uh, done with the help of some of the other agencies. So, um, yeah, on that note, I would like to thank you for your time and ask for questions. Can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, I think so. Vesa, do you, are you going to handle questions or do you want me to? Oh, go ahead, please. You know, you're the boss of the, you're the boss of the talks. Okay. So please handle it. Okay. Sure. Go ahead, Alberto. Great talk. Um, I just have a question. Uh, the, in the single layer irritate, do you have any magnetic field dependence? Um, because right now you have between zero and five Tesla. I wonder if you did it between zero and you know point three or below the, the field that makes the layers couple ferromagnetically. Um, so the second data set I showed was like plus minus zero point five Tesla. So it was plus half a Tesla and minus half a Tesla. Um, that's probably the worst field that we've that we've done. But what we found is that in STM data, at least, as you plot field, you know, in some positive direction, some negative direction, like you know, without the spin polarized STM tip, nothing changes. So it's like, I guess maybe a question for you is like, what would you expect to change based on the- well, So the, the question is, um, you show there's no correlation between antiferromagnetic paddles and, and, and the single particle gap, mm -hmm. but that's for fields that couple all the layers. So if you were to have um, dopants in layers below, I wonder if, that will still give you a correlated gap, um, not a correlated gap, it will give you a metallic state, but because the layers are coupled, you will still have an order of the spins in the topmost layer. Mm -hmm. So because you don't have sensitivity to the full unit cell, I wonder how that affects the, the description. So that, that's what I was asking below, you know, around point, point 0.1 Tesla, point 0.15 Tesla, you still have no coupling between the layers. I mean, I can, I can tell you that, you know, if, if you, once the, the, the spin of the tip is flipped, okay? yeah, and then you apply further magnetic field, nothing changes. Yeah. Like you can subtract these topographies and nothing changes there. Right, right. So it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, the, the coupling between the planes is, is interesting. You know, I, I don't really know what happens, like and how the first plane coupled to the second one. What we are just detecting is like, whatever is the aggregate kind of density of states near the surface, right? Yeah. Yeah, but um, yeah, I, I, I don't think that smaller field would actually change. Smaller field may not be able to flip the spin of the tip. So that's another problem. If you want to use right. 0.1 Tesla, you know, your tip may not change. So you're not going to see any signal. Um, yeah. No, I think it will, and I just, I think it will be interesting to know because the, the magnetic state of the sample is different above the, that field, the 0.33 Tesla. 0.33 Tesla. Oh, yeah. 33 Tesla. That's, that's the critical field that orders the four iridium oxide planes ferromagnetically. So they are still antiferromagnetic in plane, but because you have this canting angle, you can order four layers ferromagnetically. So you, you might have some canting. Are you talking about the canting of spins a little bit out of plane? No, this is all in plane. Okay. This is so this is more. This is more how you. <laughs> Okay, maybe, may, you know, this is in, in, in the picture I have in my head. Mm -hmm. uh, your in-plane spins are coupled up to, you know, J's, it's quite large to say thousands of Kelvin. But you only weakly antiferromagnetic couple the layers below T nail. Now, when you put this large field, you can couple all the layers. So now, because the top layer, it's coupled to the bottom layers, although you don't have a, diff, a, a charge dopant in the top layer, you might have it in the bottom layer, but that might disturb. I don't know, it's, it, it's, uh, to me, it's a very interesting question, right? 
all these descri- descriptions of discussions of holes in a mm-hmm. in a nail or charges in the nail order, it's in a single plane. When you have out of plane coupling, I wonder what happens. And, yeah, I think that's an interesting question. You know, we like uh, when you look at just uh, the 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 Bach measurements, right? Like yeah. uh, magnetization as a function of field, nothing really happens like too much. Yeah. These slow fields, but to what extent will the um, the planes couple? Yeah, I mean, it's you know that's something that I don't think we have the data. Like we certainly don't have the data below point five Tesla. Um, right. Um, you know, it's you know it might be something that we can look into in the future. So you're saying uh, the fields are not the planes are not going to couple. So we might actually tease out just the signal yeah. from the plane as a yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that would be really cool. Yeah, that's yeah. I think the correlation is like so messy between the charge gap and the AF order that it's like I'm not sure even if you couple. Presumably, you get some kind of average between AF ordering of the top first plane and the second plane. Yeah. Um, you know, the fact is we see like anti-formatic ordering in both small gaps and the large gaps, right? So yeah, uh, I, I'm not sure, even if you take into account the bottom plane in some random orientation, I'm not sure that could be explained, but I'll need to think about that more. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't think it's an easy, I don't think there's an easy answer. <laughs> well, it's, 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 it's a good question. Yeah, I don't, yeah, it's certainly yeah. something. To look into. No, thank you, thank you. No, thank you. Questions we have? I just want to comment that, that uh, I mean, I'm convinced. Oh, okay. <laughs> very good talk. Very good talk. What are you convinced of, Sean? <laughs> just that the tip is not moving. Ah, that the tip is not moving. <laughs> well, well, you you actually made me think about like this secondary coupling. Like we don't, you know, the overlap of the wave function is like playing some role. And like, um, you know, I don't know to what extent there are secondary effects that I kind of gloss over, but uh, I'm glad at least the dominant effect you're convinced about. So that's good. That's good. Um, I have something, it's, but it's, I think it's not really a ref, uh, well-formulated question, but I'll, but I'll ask it anyways. I think it, it's a bit related to Alberto's, but so it makes sense to me that chemically that the um, anti-ferromagnetic order is anti-correlated with where the lanthanums are because the lanthanums add the extra electron so that would just get rid of your spin locally. Um, but what's really interesting is that the metallic regions then are not correlated with that. So it makes it hard for me to understand what the nature of the metallic state is really. Do, do you have kind of more insight into that? Um, that's, you know, the, that's an excellent observation. You know, that's really like the summary of, you know, the, the, the confusion about the data and why it's surprising. Um, do I have more insight about the metallic, the, uh, the, the, like what is the metallic part? So what we see in STM is like a V-shaped gap, okay? So I can tell you maybe some of the proposals for this V-shaped gap, you know, yeah. uh, there's, uh, you know, recently there, there was a proposal that, uh, you know, a disorder. So it's a disorder induced gap. So somehow a disorder by itself, even without taking aside the doping can cause this kind of gap, you know? So that's why, you know, maybe it's not related to the anti-feminism at all. Um, there are more fancy proposals in terms of some kind of, uh, you know, flux currents. And, you know, I don't, you know, I don't remember offhand. There's uh, certainly uh, one or two proposals that, um, you know, rely, you know, similarly to this, I forget, like loop currents in like loop rates. Loop currents, yeah. You know, so um, to, you know, we, we have absolutely no evidence that, that that's what's happening, but it's, you know, there are other things that could be there. Um, that we still don't understand, you know, but like why, you know, as you said, proximity to the lanthanum that dopes it, destroys anti-ferromagnetism, you know, you kind of get that, but why is the, the gap based on the DID spectrum not reflected? Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Okay. Can I ask also a kind of a clarifying question? So um, I, I had a rough understanding of the pseudo gap in the cuprates is, is pseudo gap because it's not gap everywhere in, in momentum space. Um, but in the STM, you're, you don't really have that momentum space information. Is it? Is it? Are you just making that by analogy um, because it kind of has the same sort of spectral shape? Yeah, that, that's exactly right. So I guess uh, okay. know, it might be a little bit sloppy of me. Um, your, your understanding of Cooper pseudo gap is probably as good as mine. Yeah, so it's a partial gap opening at the Fermi level. You know, it's pseudo because we don't know what it's coming from, right? So it's once we figure out yeah. what it's coming from, that's it's a pair density wave or charge density wave gap or whatever. 
is not a Suda anymore. Here, you know, I, I just, and the literature also kind of call it Suda gap on the quotes is, you know, it wasn't clear why it's there, you know, why is it mm-hmm. like such V shape and, you know, but uh, once you identify what it is, um, and I think there might be some evidence from Arpes that it is like a partial opening of the gap as well. Um, yeah, they do um, some potassium, you know, they do the surface potassium doping. Right. Um, there's that, yeah, that Arpes paper. That's right. So um, you can see like parts of the Fermi surface, yeah, obviously, like kind of disappear. So in that sense, you know, it would fit a uh, pseudogap description. But, you know, I, I think the key is, you know, not to call something a pseudogap, but really to figure out what is it from, right? And I am not sure if we actually like have a full understanding of what's going on in the um, at least, you know, in my opinion, but maybe, you know, recently there was some new results, what happens in here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, there's an old problem that uh, I'm wondering whether your technique can resolve, that is gapless superconductors in when you have, um, let's say, you put iron impurity into niobium, for example, you, you can destroy the superconductivity altogether, but if you look closely, there's some remnants of superconductivity still left there. But it's just that the sample never uh, achieves zero resistance, it still has a large resistance. But if you look at the temperature dependence of the resistance, it looks like still there's an onset of a superconducting transition. Mm-hmm. So I'm um, just wondering, the, the people in the 60s called this gapless superconductors. So mm-hmm. I'm wondering, this is the same pseudo gap people are talking about. Um. So, I mean, the pseudogap in Cooper's, at least, you know, back in the day, you know, there was some notion that it might be, you know, preformed pairing, uh, yes. you know, so um, I don't know if that's still the understanding of, you know, um, the pseudogap in Cooper's or not. But in terms of, you know, can we do these experiments, you mentioned like R and dope, like niobium, for example, yes. um, you know, STM or spin polarized STM in general is kind of limited to uh, flat surfaces um, that are, you know, somewhat conductive. Um, so can you create this niobium that's doped, that's like perfectly flat? If you can, you know, maybe then we're in business and we can try to answer that question. But if you can't, um, that's typical the first bottleneck for any STM me- measurement. Like if the surface is rough, and by rough, I mean like a few nanometer roughness is too much. <laughs> you know, oh, okay. uh, right, so it okay. needs to be really like almost atomically flat mm-hmm. or like 10, 20 nanometer region that you can scan. So I don't know if that sample that you, you have in mind, in, you know, mm-hmm. but then even then, you know, the secondary, um, kind of problem with SDM measurement, mm-hmm. um, you know, to what extent is surface representative of the bulk, you know, so mm-hmm. that we kind of go out of our ways to say, okay, at least in some samples, what we see in the surface is mm-hmm. neutron or like whatever bulk mm-hmm. measurements, and then, you know, maybe, you know, it's generally surface is representative of the bulk. So in this mm-hmm. example, again, of, you know, R and dope, they will be, you know, like, I don't, I don't know, but it's, uh, you know, I, I haven't thought about that system much. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Since we're bringing up old problems, um, I'm not as old as Sean, but um, and maybe it's not fair to keep asking about things that you didn't talk about. But in the in the cuprates, um, I know you said the the underdope regimes are really not accessible. Um, but in the highly overdoped regime, I, I think there are still open questions about the magnetism there. There are proposals for you know ferromagnetism or kind of um, ferromagnetic percolation, mm-hmm. um, and there are some USR studies which had evidence for that. Um, I'm wondering if there's any hope of exploring that sort of regime um, with with spin polarized STM. Yeah. So the, the, the well, first of all, cuprates. I don't think it's unfair just because like I did my PhD on cuprates, so I feel like I should be okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. yeah. Even though um, the first bottleneck is uh, kind of like what what samples you know are we talking about? Because in terms of yeah. So this this would be you know this was lanthanum copper oxide. So this is really I, I think this is a difficult one for you. Right. That's right. So they don't clean. Yeah. And right now, it seems like there's some effort that, that where you grow, well, not some effort. I mean, that there's a lot of good LSEO, LCO thin films, uh, but in a sense, uh, good for transport. Um, I don't think the surface, at least looking at a few papers coming out recently, the surface exhibits some reconstruction. That's very clear, you know, and it depends on the doping level and so on. So it's, I don't think the films are there yet for you to be able to explore the surface, even conventional SDM. Um, so that's why, you know, um, spin polarized is gonna be even harder, but like the box single crystals don't cleave. Like I haven't tried it myself, but that was the general kind of uh, wisdom that, you know, it's really nearly impossible to cleave. And then mm-hmm. the second reason is like, 
you know, typically funding agencies may not be as excited about going back to cook by itself, right. I think, you know. Yeah. Um, I think if there was some proposal in, you know, business based coup rates that see the same thing in overdop regime, then, you know, it, it, it might be possible. Like, for example, surface doping, right? Like if you're able to, I guess, potassium is electron doping. So I don't know if there's something else that can dope it the other way, the overdop regime, um, you know, maybe, you know, then you can use this thing. Okay. Can I ask another question? Uh, I don't know how, how, is there any dependence on, on cooling rate or are you able to check that? Um, Cause you mentioned things like glassiness. And so I wonder if. Uh... Um, yeah, so the glassiness, uh, the, the term that was used in that paper, um, which um, I guess denotes, you know, some kind of stripy behavior that's not necessarily ordered perfectly. Um, to what extent were they able to control the cooling rate? I don't, I'm not aware that in any of the, you know, the, 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 the work that I was talking about, so certainly not our work, but in general, that the cooling rate is something that we pay, pay attention to. So you typically, you know, you take a sample, you cool it to your base temperature or whatever you want to, you know, but it's, we never talk about if it's done over the course of hour or like 30 seconds, right? So it's, I don't, yeah. um, I don't know, I don't even know how to control it, to be completely honest, because you just stick your sample into the SDM that's held at four Kelvin. Um, I see. Okay. And maybe slow you down a little bit if you turn on the heater, but it's, it's it would be really hard. I see. Okay. Is it is it clear now? Why is it so important to cleave it at seven at like low temperature? Yeah. So it's not important for all the samples. So there's samples that cleave at room temperature just fine. Um, and then, you know, when you image the surface, it's like what you expect based on the crystal structure. For iridates, for some reason, and that's not the case for cuprates, but for iridates, if you cleave at, cleave at room temperature, there's a prominent surface reconstruction. So the surface that you see, it's going to be periodic to some extent, but the lattice constant is some crazy like 3 a naught or 4 a naught. You see various little stripes. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's why we cleave at low temperature. The lower, typically the better. Um, in general, you know, but um, again, for some systems, it doesn't matter. But, you know, we have a cleaver that can go down to 80 Kelvin. Recently, we've been cleaving even lower temperature by sticking the whole thing in the STM with a cleave post to cool it Kelvin and quickly, you know, but it's, uh, um, yeah, so that's the reason. Just there's some weird surface reconstruction that shows up if you don't do that in your Thanks. Do you see any domains in, in terms of in, in the single layer? Can you find domain walls? Can you, can you see what happens there? Uh, can we find domain walls in the single layer? Yeah. Um.